got to um, some of the information about changes in ventricular volume. Um, and I drew you that little um, diagram using a beaker in, to replace the left ventricle. Um, so we said endurance training increases end diastolic volume, probably decreases end systolic volume, and therefore we increase stroke volume. So to maintain Q, we see a decrease in heart rate, or vice versa, chicken egg. I'm not sure which one comes first. Okay. Um, in moderately trained or untrained, stroke volumes going to increase up to about 40 to 50 percent and then plateau we see a bit higher in trained people. Remember heart rate is linear with workload so it just continues to increase until we fall on our face which makes heart rate a very good indicator of training intensity so it's one of the reasons why I like to use heart rate when we're looking at intensities because it, it doesn't lie and it's very cheap and easy to monitor. Okay? So remember that the role of Q, cardiac output, is to make sure that we are getting enough oxygen to the working muscles for the workload that we're asking them to do. Okay? Now, at rest, we also see an increase in um, stroke volume because of some of the other adaptations to endurance training, to aerobic training. So we see quite a big increase in plasma volume in aerobic athletes. And so the volume of blood coming back to the heart, so another reason why we see an increase in end diastolic volume, the volume of blood coming back to the heart is larger because of this additional plasma volume. And so that comes into the left ventricle and stretches the wall. And we have a uh, myocardial version of the stretch reflex. It's not to do with a stretch receptor, it's to do with the stretch on the heart walls. So, and it's called the Frank Starling mechanism. So what that means is that if I put a stretch on the wall, they contract harder. So if we put those two pieces of information together, we bring back more blood into the left ventricle, so we increase end diastolic volume, EDV. We stretch the wall and we see the Frank Starling mechanism, stronger contraction, and so we, not only do we have stronger heart walls anyway because we're doing endurance training, we add this mechanism in, and so ESV goes down. Stroke volume increases, heart rate at any workload is lower than it was before we were well trained, and heart rate at rest goes down hopefully a lot. Right? So if we um, look at resistance training for strength rather than um, aerobic training, we don't see much change in end diastolic volume. We do see an increase in the thickness, the mass of the left ventricle wall, right? So that allows it to contract more strongly against these very, very high blood pressures that we get in the system when we do resistance training, okay? So when we do resistance training, we do not, because we don't see a change in stroke volume, we do not expect to see a change in resting heart rate. Okay? So if you want your resting heart rate down from 73 to 61, you have to do aerobic work. Right? That's physiologically the only way to achieve it. Okay? Alright. So We've covered most of the information we want on the heart. Now we're going to look at the vascular system. So we're going to look at arteries and veins a little bit. And the first idea we've got to talk about is a physical law 
that governs flow. And it doesn't matter whether it's flow of a liquid or flow of a gas. Um, we always move from an area of high to an area of low. All right, and we'll also see it when it comes to ions and molecules later on. So it doesn't matter what the substrate is. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but hopefully you know what I mean. It always moves from high to low. Right, that's the rule. So when we look at blood flow, which is a liquid, it flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Remember I said that aorta has the highest pressure in the whole system. So not only do we have this massive contraction of the left ventricle, we've got this physical law helping out to move the blood from the aorta around the rest of the system where the pressure drops as you move around the system. Okay? So the rate, bless you, the rate of flow, the speed or the amount of the flow is also proportional to the pressure at either end of the mm, vessel that it's running through or the chambers from one chamber to another chamber. Okay, so that gives us an equation that says that blood flow is equivalent to a change in pressure over resistance to the flow. Okay, so if we wanted to increase blood flow, which is exactly what we need if we're going to do exercise, right, or physical activity, then we can increase the pressure difference across the system. That occurs a little bit because of the force of the contraction increases as we work harder. And or we can decrease the resistance to the blood flow, right? So that can occur by changing the radius of the artery, okay? And so by changing the radius, we can make a massive difference in blood flow. Both those things occur simultaneously during exercise, okay? So um, decreasing the resistance, changing the radius of the, of the vessel, of the artery, is more useful. Um, than the pressure difference. We could also change the length of the vessel, but that's not a realistic um, mechanism in a, in a body, right? If I'm making something, that, then that's also a way of changing blood flow by lengthening the, the system. But we can't do that. We can control the radius of the arteries, and that not only allows us to increase blood flow to the working muscle, it allows us to direct blood flow away from other areas that aren't needed at that time to the muscles that are doing the work, okay? So one of the reasons that aerobic work is so um, highly linked with health outcomes long term as we get older, particularly cardiovascular outcomes, is because a lot of people develop these plaque buildups within the arteries. And plaque buildup does exactly what we don't want to happen, right? Instead of increasing the radius now, the plaque is decreasing the area the blood has to get through. Right? That massively increases blood pressure. Even if, it, even if the plaque is relatively small. Right? So anyone who's developing plaque because uh, they um, eat a lot of fatty foods, or they're sedentary, or they have a genetic predisposition to, to plaque, right? many reasons, then 
those people are going to um, have symptoms of high blood pressure, chronic high blood pressure, and we talked about some of the problems with chronic high blood pressure. And you know what's really sad? Is with the overweight and obesity issues that we're seeing in children now, they're finding plaque buildup in coronary arteries in children as young as 10. So um, we've really set them up to be unhealthy for the rest of their lives. But the adults are doing a great job there. Um, we looked at something like this in lab, so just a reminder, systolic blood pressure is the highest pressure occurring during systole, which is the contraction phase. Diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure occurring during diastole, the relaxation phase. Okay, uh, normal, we want less than 120 over less than 80. And remember, a consistent picture of either number being above that would lead to a diagnosis of hypertension, okay? Um, we have a pre-hypertension category. So depending where you look, some uh, resources call it a pre-hypertension, some call it high normal, 120 to 139. Personally, I prefer the pre-hypertension because people understand that hypertension isn't good, right? And so if you tell them they're pre-hypertensive, then I think that just that language might be more motivating than telling them they're high normal, because normal's okay, right? Okay? So I wouldn't use high normal personally. I don't, I don't think it's a, a beneficial term when we're looking at trying to motivate people to change their lifestyle. Okay? 120 to 139, 80 to 89. Hypertension has two stages, stage one, moderate, 140 to 159, or 90 to 99. And stage two, like bed rest, probably, from your doctor, over 160 or over 100, okay? If you're stage two hypertensive, you are very poorly. Right? This is very dangerous because if there's any weakening of a coronary artery or any of the arteries in your brain, any weakening of the wall which occurs when you have chronic high blood pressure, you can drop with a stroke or a heart attack at any second. Right? So this is, this is not safe at all. We would not have a stage two person doing exercise, right? Because that's just too dangerous. Because we raise blood pressure when we exercise. It's already way too high, okay? Um, increased cardiac output, which is a good thing when we're exercising will increase blood pressure, so we've got more fluid in the same area, in the same space, so we do see increases in blood pressure, both with aerobic work and with resistance work, although it's much worse with resistance work. But a really good thing about aerobic work is that it increases the capacitance of the arteries and capacitance is the fancy term for elasticity so the artery walls get more flexible the more aerobic work i do the more flexible they are the less likely we are to see plaque buildup right plaque buildup leads to hardening of the artery walls right so the more elastic i can make the arteries the lower my blood pressure will be. Okay. All right, so 
a lot of adaptations that we see. Okay. So it depends whether we're looking at the acute situation, what happens that minute when I'm exercising versus a chronic situation due to training effect. All right. So let's look at the acute situation first of all. If we're doing aerobic work, so we are walking, right? We are running, we are riding our bikes, we are swimming laps, okay? Then when we do aerobic work, we see an increase in systolic pressure, so that contraction phase, the numbers go up. But in diastolic pressure, in the relaxation phase, we see very little change. Okay. Now, that's also used as a diagnostic tool. Okay. When we looked at the ECG, I said that if you were doing a stress test or you were over in Dr. Barlow's lab doing a VO2 max test and he saw something weird going on with any segment of that ECG, he would call a stop. We have a similar situation because not only will they be monitoring your heart rate, they'll also be monitoring your blood pressure. We had a similar situation. If I'm running on the treadmill or riding the stationary bike and my diastolic pressure is going up, they'll stop the test because that is not typical and that would be indicative of a problem. Right? So the systolic pressure, remember we're looking at rest, we're looking for less than 120. It can go up to around 250 during an aerobic session, all right? But that diastolic pressure is going to wobble around my 80, right? Less than 80, okay? Now, resistance work is a totally different picture, all right? We see huge changes in blood pressure both on the contraction phase and the relaxation phase, okay? So, um, a really huge number that has been um, seen and noted in the literature is 320 over 250. 320 over 250. Now that's an extreme, right? So for most of us when we're in the weight room, we're not going to see blood pressures of, of that ilk. But it's still very important to understand that, you know, who do I give a resistance training program to? Not someone who is hypertensive, right? The goal with someone who's hypertensive is to bring their blood pressure down first and then worry about holistic fitness, right? So from a chronic perspective when we look at what's the training effect. So if I'm, I'm not just out for a, a walk now, I walk every day on a regular basis, then we see both aerobic and weight training um, resistance type work can bring resting blood pressure down for normotensive or moderately hypertensive individuals. So if we go back to that table, right, then line one, two, and possibly line three, we would see a reduction in resting blood pressure. Now, it's not huge, right? Somewhere between three and seven millimeters of mercury. Um, so it's not a massive change, but it makes a difference in health outcomes. Any blood pressures during submaximal work come down for that level of work, right? And as I've already said, aerobic training increases capacitance. So um, just so that you don't think I'm being a little hysterical, somewhere, discusses the dangers of 
exercising if you have high blood pressure, but I can't find it. So when you're looking through the chapter, see if you can find that box and have a look. Um, because the last thing you want, um, you know, particularly if you're a personal trainer, and, and you are trying to help someone get healthy, is for them to have a heart attack because you gave them an inappropriate training program. Right? That, that would not be very happy making. Okay. All right, I have to switch PowerPoints here. blood flow and blood pressure. Have a quick look at red blood cells because they're very important when we're looking at exercise, right? Not so important if we're looking at infections, then we want to look at white blood cells. But for exercise, particularly aerobic work, our red blood cell count can make a big difference, all right? So, Red blood cells are the carrier of the oxygen in the bloodstream, all right? And it's not the red blood cell itself, it's the hemoglobin molecule that is, sits inside the red blood cell. Heme means it contains iron, okay? So for hemoglobin to do its job properly and to pick up oxygen, there must be iron available. So when we look at diet and we look at nutrition, iron can be important to performance, depending on what kind of athlete you are. Right? So the more hemoglobin I've got, i.e. the more red blood cells I've got, the better able I am to carry masses of oxygen to the working muscles. Right? Um, in adults, red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow of our long bones, so fingers, arms, legs, toes, and um, they cannot reproduce. Before they're released from the bone marrow, the nuclei gets um, removed, and so they have a finite lifespan, okay? And that lifespan is about... Um, four months, three to four months. Um, and in someone who's healthy, the production of red blood cells would relatively well balance out the destruction of the old red blood cells. And then when they're destroyed, when they've done their job after three to four months, they get reabsorbed, that iron gets reabsorbed and used to make more red blood cells. Okay. So normally that is well balanced. In someone that needs a bone marrow transplant, that isn't happening. Right? So someone who has to have a marrow transplant is going to suffer with high levels of fatigue. Um, they'll get out of breath very easily. Right? They, they won't have a lot of energy to do very much. And that's why they need a bone marrow transplant. Okay, um, they're really painful for both the person having the transplant and the person donating the bone marrow. So if anybody does that or if you ever are in a position to offer that, you know, that's, that is, people are so grateful because it is, it's a pretty painful operation. Um, so, Given this is what red blood cells do, what do we think happens if we train the aerobic system, right? Remember that adaptation is typically positive to make the exercise easier. So not surprisingly, we see an increase in red blood cell production. We also see an increase in plasma volume, which we'll talk about. 
So when we measure endurance athletes, they have a much higher blood volume level than a norm normal person, right? A low active person, okay? That increase in blood volume then allows for much greater oxygen delivery to the working muscles. The more oxygen I've got, the more ATP I can make, the longer, faster I can run. Right? It's pretty straightforward. Scenario. So again, acute means like that day. What happens to my plasma volume when I start training today? Right? So at the beginning of training, and it doesn't seem to matter whether that training is aerobic endurance type work or resistance or weight training type work, anything that's relatively intense physical activity the initial effect is a, quite a large reduction in plasma volume, which seems a bit odd, but if you understand a little bit about volumes and solutes, you'll know that if I've got a set amount of solute within a volume of liquid, and I reduce the liquid, then the ratio of solute goes up without having more solute there, right? So in our case, if I reduce plasma volume, that means that per spoon of blood, I've got a lot more red blood cells than I had before the plasma volume was reduced, right? So in the short term, today, that's very beneficial because it, if I'm an aerobic athlete, or, I, or I'm, you know, I'm someone that does aerobic work to help my health outcomes and my fitness, then that means that in the short term, my oxygen carrying ability goes up, right? I can do more aerobic work, okay? So if that aerobic exercise is going to be quite long, then we can see a decrease of up to 20% in plasma volume. When we start looking at dehydration, this is an important idea to pay attention to. And that's it, particularly if you're in hot or humid conditions. So over here we have very hot conditions. In the south, so when I was in Alabama, the, the stress on the body was almost worse because we had really hot weather and ridiculous levels of humidity, right? So you've got like this double whammy. Um, if you do weight training, then the decreases, again, could be anywhere from no change at all up to 20%. So probably dependent upon, you know, do you work out in a gym that's nice and cool because they're willing to pay the air conditioning bill? Um, or do you work out in a you know, little hole in the wall that's baking hot with the windows open and, and everybody's sweating like crazy, right? Um, if you're training for long enough, then that sweat loss can also play a role in whether or not you get up to 20%. So that heat humidity plays a big role. Okay. Now, we see something called sport anemia, and we'll talk more about anemia um, 
later, but sport anemia is a situation that occurs when you bring your athletes back from some time off. So if I, um, we get them back pre-season after the summer, right? And over the summer, they were doing either nothing at all, depending on how motivated they are, or they were doing some kind of maintenance program probably, right? So when I bring them back, that initial training is gonna increase their fitness levels. So what we see is this, um, is a reduction in um, plasma volume, but it, it skews their, their blood test a little bit, right? So that it looks like they might be somewhat anemic, but they're not. It's just the beginning of a training cycle, okay? Okay, so chronically, what happens with um, plasma volume, right? So we see an increase in plasma volume over time. So we see this initial decrease on the day, but over time, we see increases in plasma volume and increases in blood volume, okay? Um, I wanted to highlight this table. This is resting adaptations. So this is chronic training effects, right? What is happening at rest with all these different variables? So whether I'm doing aerobic or resistance, we see an increase in left ventricular mass. Whether I'm doing um, endurance, aerobic or resistance, we don't see very much change in cardiac output. Remember that we talked Wednesday? What day is it? Friday. Wednesday. We talked about Q, right? Q is responsible for providing enough oxygen for the workload. The workload when I'm resting doesn't change whether I'm trained or not trained. I'm resting. I'm not doing anything, right? So there would not be any reason to see an adaptation there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, if we do aerobic work, we see an increase in stroke volume and a decrease in resting heart rate. If we do resistance work, we don't see very much change in stroke volume, so we see very little, if any, change in resting heart rate. Okay. So I think I like the table because it kind of pulls it all together in one place for everybody. Right. Um, chronic effect on the plasma volume, it can go up 12 to 20%. Um, resistance doesn't seem to uh, change plasma volume at all. Um, if I've got more plasma volume, that impacts Q when I'm exercising. So we see changes between a sedentary person and a training person in Q and stroke volume and heart rate when they're exercising. So we will look at 
what happens within the cardiovascular system when we exercise that allows this additional oxygen to reach the muscles and reach the mitochondria, right? Because there's no point in having all this additional oxygen buzzing around in my bloodstream, hanging on to hemoglobin for, for life or death. Right? It can't do anything in the bloodstream. It has to be not only inside the muscle tissue, but inside the mitochondria within the muscle cell. Right? So we're going to look at how does that happen? How, how do we get it from the bloodstream to the mitochondria? And we will do that on Monday. Okay? Any questions, Chris? No, I'm firing with everything. Not at the moment? Okay. No. Just have a little look at it over the weekend so that if you have no. questions Monday, we can deal with those first before we carry on. Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. Are you done with your midterms? Have you got any more this afternoon? Yeah, I've just got one more. One more? Okay, you're almost there. Oh, You're almost there. Get that last one done and then take the weekend to enjoy yourself. You earned it, okay? Yeah, thank you. All right. I'll see you on Monday. All right. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I've got grading to do, so oh. that's not so fun, but it'll be all right. <laughs> all right. Bye.